All right, hello, how's everybody doing today? Uh, my name is Blake Yeager. I am the, uh, direct, er, the director of Next Generation Markets at Rackspace, which is basically a fancy way of saying I work on things that are not products yet. Um, and specifically, what I've been working on for about the last six months or so is ZeroVM, which is a new open source technology um, that uh, Rackspace has invested heavily in. Most of the core contributors of the technology do work for Rackspace today. Uh, but we're hoping that, you know, over the course of this week and the next few months, we're going to start to change that and get more committers involved from outside of Rackspace as well. Uh, I have Camwell Gilliadelf here, who's the uh, creator of ZeroVM. I'm going to invite Cam up on stage later on when we do a little bit of Q&A at the end of this session. Uh, but before then, what we're going to do is basically give an overview of ZeroVM. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the use cases that are enabled by ZeroVM. And then specifically, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the integration between ZeroVM and OpenStack Swift. Uh, and how you can kind of turn Swift from just a basic object storage solution into a converged compute and storage platform. Uh, and I'm going to do a live demo, so I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that goes well. Uh, please be forgiving if, uh, if it does not. So what is ZeroVM? Uh, you know, the, most, the simplest way to describe ZeroVM is it creates a secure, isolated execution environment in which you can run a single application process or really any arbitrary code. Um, and then you can take ZeroVM and embed it into storage systems, even multi-tenant storage systems such as Swift, and you can allow users to process, manipulate, search, do any type of arbitrary computing on their data inside of the storage system without having to pull your data out of the storage system uh, and load it, either download it locally or pull it into a, co a compute cluster or a Hadoop cluster or something like that. Some of the technical details behind ZeroVM, so it's based on a project called Google Native Client uh, or NACL. Uh, so NACL is a technology that Google originally created to allow them to allow users to safely run native code inside the browser. It's embedded in, uh, in Chrome today. Uh, and what we did was we took that native client technology, we extracted it from the Chromium project, uh, and we made it suitable to run server side and specifically to embed in storage systems like we were talking about. Uh, it leverages ZeroMQ for networking, although we're in the middle of kind of rewriting, rewriting uh, the way some of that networking works. Uh, it includes a full compiler tool chain. So there's a GCC tool chain that allows you to cross compile anything you've written in C, even assembly, uh, and you wind up with an executable that you can execute inside of a ZeroVM instance. Uh, and then we have what we call the ZeroVM runtime, or ZRT. So ZeroVM by itself basically provides you a bare x86 execution environment. And what ZRT does is it includes a port of glibc. Uh, it provides basically a subset of the POSIX API. Uh, it provides an emulated in-memory file system, so you have kind of something that starts to look like a system instead of just kind of a bare process. Um, and it also includes things like a port of the C Python interpreter, so if you have Python code, um, you can actually just pass that into a ZeroVM instance as a tarball, and you can execute it using the port of C Python that we already have included in ZRT. So another way that we like to describe ZeroVM is it's really a computing platform that consists of a group of technologies. You know, one of those is the core ZeroVM technology that creates the, the sandbox, that trusted execution environment. Uh, another is the ZRT technology that we were just describing, uh, all built around a set of core principles. So I want to kind of talk through those principles um, and what they mean to the ZeroVM team and the ZeroVM project. Uh, the first is this idea of being secure, I mean, so, sorry, small, light, and fast. Um, so the, the ZeroVM executable is only about 75 kilobytes of code, so it's very small. Uh, you can start a ZeroVM instance in as little as five milliseconds, so you can start it very quickly. Um, it's very lightweight, uh, and it's fast. So once you, there is an upfront validation process that occurs, but you can, you can actually go ahead and pre-validate code that's going to execute inside of the ZeroVM uh, execution environment, and once it's been pre-validated, you're basically running at native performance. There's no overhead that's kind of, you know, sitting between uh, your code that's running and the hardware that it's running on. It's very secure. We talked about the security derives from the uh, Google Native Client project. So not only do we create this inner and outer sandbox around the execution environment that we're providing to users, but we also go through and we validate all of the code that's going to be running inside that sandbox. We use the stock validator from, from NACL, um, and that ensures that nothing that's executing inside that sandbox is going to either maliciously um, or accidentally break out and do anything that it should not be doing. 
Um, we like to describe ZeroVM as hyper-elastic, and this is the idea that you, know, you can use an entire cluster of machines, hundreds or thousands of machines for a few seconds at a time uh, by creating ZeroVM instances on all of these machines, networking them together, um, and then spinning them up and then spinning them back down and disposing of them when you're done. Um, so instead of having to you know, pay for an hour or even a minute of a virtual machine, you can start to you know, use seconds or even milliseconds of compute across large clusters. It's embeddable, so we talked about the ability to embed ZeroVM inside of multi-tenant storage systems. We're gonna go a lot more into the integration with OpenStack Swift today, uh, but it's by no means limited to being integrated into OpenStack Swift. It could be embedded in other storage systems as well. Uh, we like to think about it as being functionally pure, where we sometimes use the word deterministic to describe this. And basically what that means is for any given set of inputs, and we control the inputs into a ZeroVM instance very carefully, uh, you will always be guaranteed the exact same output. Um, and this is important for a couple of reasons. One, it allows us to do things like uh, inside of Swift, when you've got three copies of an object stored on three different physical nodes, you can actually process all three of those copies in parallel, and you can be guaranteed you're gonna wind up with the same result in all three locations. It also allows us to do things like pause execution of that environment, move it to a different physical uh, location, restart execution, uh, we can replay execution, uh, if, we can, if we have the same inputs, we can kind of replay and wind up with the same output, so it makes it a lot easier for debugging and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, the last point up here, it's open source. We believe in creating a community around this. It's all available today, uh, Apache 2.0 license. Uh, all the repositories are available on GitHub. All of the documentation uh, is published on our website, zervm.org, uh, or docs.zervm.org is the, the documentation site specifically. So one of the questions that I get asked a lot when uh, I'm describing ZeroVM to people is how does this fit in the, in the realm of other virtualization technologies? So I kind of threw together this slide where I want to kind of talk a little bit about the difference between traditional virtual machines, uh, containers, things like LXC or OpenVZ, and then ZeroVM, and where they're similar and where they're different. Uh, so the, the common thread between all of these different technologies is there are ways to safely share hardware between multiple users or multiple you know, processes in, in, on a single physical host. Um, but that's kind of where the similarities end. You know, we talk about traditional virtual machines, you have a dedicated kernel and an operating system, and you can customize that in any way that you would like. Um, you do have the overhead that's created by kind of presenting an entire virtualized set of hardware to each of those individual uh, machines. So startup is a little bit, tends to be a little bit slower, but you do have really good security because everybody is very well isolated from, from the other users. Comparing that to something like containers, you usually have a shared kernel and operating system between multiple containers. Uh, that lowers the overhead, it allows for a much faster startup time, uh, but you wind up sacrificing some of that security. Now, there's been a lot of work uh, in the last few years around you know, C groups and namespaces, specifically with LXC, to, to make it more secure. Uh, but you still wind up opening yourselves up uh, to some, some chances of you know, somebody inside a container being able to either DDoS the underlying system you know, with, through syscalls or something like that, uh, or a bug in the kernel uh, exposing something to other users that it, that it shouldn't be exposing. Uh, and then you've got zero VM, where you don't have a kernel or an operating system at all. It's, you're really not virtualizing a system at all. It's really more of a pr single process, a single execution environment that you're providing. Um, very low overhead, very fast startup. And because of that validation that we're doing, we maintain that security that makes it safe to run this uh, and to even allow users to execute arbitrary code inside of multi-tenant systems, such as public cloud storage services. So what are some of the use cases enabled by ZeroVM? Um, so the first one, we, think, we usually think about two different groups of use cases. Uh, the first one is going to be this idea of data local computing. So you have your data stored somewhere, perhaps in a, in a storage service, a public cloud storage service, um, and now instead of you having to pull your data to your application to process it, you can actually take your application and push it to your data um, and execute your data in place without having to move it around. The other group of use cases that we like to talk about are kind of simple scale-out architecture. 
So zero VM does impose some constraints on the design um, and architecture of applications, but if you're willing to operate within the constraints of zero VM, what you wind up with is an application and data bundle that can be scaled horizontally as easily as you can distribute your data. So instead of having a multi-tier application where you've got a load balancer tier and a web tier that you know, scales out very well horizontally and then some sort of centralized database that's very difficult to scale horizontally um, and a bunch of interconnects between these different layers, you wind up with an application and data bundle that you can very easily scale and just distribute with a dumb proxy in front of it, distribute the load across that data. So embedding zero VM in OpenStack Swift. So for the Swift developers in the room, apologize about my overly simplified uh, Swift architecture diagram here. Uh, but for those that are not Swift developers uh, and are not super familiar with the architecture of Swift, at, at its most basic layer, Swift has a layer of proxies, um, which can very easily be scaled, um, and then a layer of storage nodes. And there is what's called the ring. It's basically a distributed hash table that maps uh, individual objects onto specific locations on those storage nodes. So when an object gets stored in Swift, it gets first sent to the proxy. The proxy looks up in the ring where it should store the three copies of this. Well, Swift is configurable. You can store n number of copies. Most installations store three copies. Uh, Rackspace Cloud Files uses a, a replication factor of three. So it picks three storage nodes. It sends the data to those storage nodes uh, and then returns a requ uh, response to the user that the data has been stored successfully. So when we integrate zero VM with OpenStack Swift, and I'm gonna get into a more detailed architecture diagram in just a second, we install uh, what we call the zero cloud middleware, um, and that installs in the proxy nodes, and we also run that on the object storage nodes themselves. And that zero cloud middleware is what's going to enable us to actually execute the zero VM uh, instances on those object storage nodes where the data resides. So I realize this is a pretty busy diagram. I'm gonna to try to kind of talk through this in, in, a, in a real world example. Uh, and then I wanna kind of pull up uh, a live environment that we have and kind of show some demos of this running. So basically, if you look at what's happening inside of zero VM, we've got the zero cloud middleware, which is running on the proxy. The user sends a request into that, to that middleware and it's that request to the zero VM middleware are flagged with a specific header in the request. Um, and that request can include a couple of things. It doesn't have to, but it can include the application or the image that you actually want to run inside the zero VM in instance. Um, and it, can, it needs to include what we call a job description file. And that job description file tells the middleware exactly what it needs to execute and on what objects inside of Swift it needs to execute those on. Uh, and you can do things in this job description file like, you know, say, I use wildcard, so you can say, I want to search every object inside this container, and the middleware will actually go out and pull the container listing from the container nodes. Uh, it'll figure out, okay, there's these 100 different objects that are stored inside this container, and these objects reside on these, you know, 100 different physical nodes, and then the middleware goes out and starts a zero VM instance on each of those physical nodes to search the object that happens to be located on that node, and then the result can be aggregated back together. Um, you, can do, you can kind of connect all of these zero VM instances to a single reducer node, for example, and you can aggregate those results on that reducer node. Um, you can concatenate those results in the proxy, um, and you can either store that as a new object inside of Swift, or you can return that to the user as a response to the, uh, to the request that initiated this. Um, you can also have the application that you're going to execute inside the zero VM instance can also be stored already inside of Swift as an object and it can be pre-validated uh, if it's already stored inside of Swift. So if you look at that connector that can, you know, talks to the get handler and accesses a file, that would be if the middleware needs to go out and actually pull a copy of the application that's going to be executing inside of Swift. It does that using the standard get handler that already exists. Um, and like we talked about, you can build networks of these instances and so, you'll kind of see the executor that's residing on the object storage nodes. It handles connecting the individual zero VM session that it creates on that node uh, to other zero VM sessions that might be running in this cluster, allowing you to kind of create entire MapReduce operations or really any uh, directed acyclic graph that you, that you would like to define in the job manifest file. 
All right, so now I'm going to swap over to a live demo. So let me exit out of here real fast. All right, so this environment that, this environment that we're demoing right here is what we're calling Zebra. Um, it's located at zebra.zerovm.org. This is a playground environment uh, that the team, the ZeroVM team has stood up to allow the community to begin to experiment and get their hands on uh, the ZeroVM technology without having to download it and set up their own environment to really experiment with this. Um, we're going to be making, you know, over the next few weeks, we're going to be opening this environment up to more and more members of the community. Um, so if you're interested, you know, please let us know and we'll, we'll get you on the list to get access to this environment. It's about four racks of gear that's currently stood up uh, in a data center just, out of, just outside of Washington, D.C. And it contains a standard Swift installation with the ZeroVM middleware installed on the proxy nodes and the object storage nodes like we talked about. Uh, the file manager that you're seeing up here, this is a uh, basic JavaScript file manager that the ZeroVM team uh, has written. Uh, it provides all of your standard Swift functionality that you would expect, you know, the ability to create containers, um, upload objects, download objects, um, things like that. Oh, sorry. Um, as well as some additional functionality that's enabled uh, by ZeroVM, such as the ability to execute applications or, you know, execute uh, job descriptions like we're talking about. So the first demo that we're going to go through is going to be kind of a basic word count demo. And so what we've done is we've written uh, a basic mapper function in Python. So we're going to use the standard Python interpreter that's built into the ZeroVM runtime to execute this mapper. Uh, and this is going to go through, and it's going to open up a book. We've got uh, books from the uh, Gutenberg data set preloaded into a container. I'll show, you, I'll show you those in a second. So it's going to go up, open a book, and go through and run a word count on that. And then we have a basic reducer function that, again, we've written in Python. And this is basically going to take all of the output from each of these word count, these mappers that are going to be running, and create a report for us that we're going to be able to view in, in the response. And what we've got here, this JSON file, this word count Shakespeare.json, this is what we call a job description file. And so I'm going to kind of talk through this a little bit because this is it, actually how you tell the ZeroVM middleware exactly what you want it to do um, and how you want it to do it. So the first thing you'll see is you're basically telling it for these mapper nodes, for the word count mapper nodes, you're going to be executing it using the Python that's built into to ZeroVM. And what you're doing is you want to connect standard in um, based, on, based on the object that is connected to that mapper node. And what you do here is you tell it the path that you want to actually execute this on. So we've got Swift. The little dot in there is just an easy way of saying my account inside of Swift instead of having to put a big, long auth um, token. And so in the Gutenberg container, I want to search every object that matches that wildcard, 1WS star, uh, which happens to be all of the works of William Shakespeare that are, that are stored in the, uh, in the Gutenberg data set. And then each of these mappers, you want to connect those. So here's, here's where we're kind of describing the, uh, the way we're going to connect the network to the single word, word count reducer that we're creating. And then we've got a description of the word count reducer. Here is the path to the reducer code that we want to actually execute inside of this. Um, and then we're basically not going to connect standard out to anything, which will mean that it will be returned as the output of this will be returned as part of the request when it's executed. Um, and just to show you where this is actually going to be running against, here's the container where we have all of the Gutenberg data stored. Um, and so that's where it's actually going to be running. So when we go and we actually go through and execute this, we're sending this job description to the zero cloud middleware that's running on that proxy nodes. It's going out and doing the lookups, figuring out where those objects reside. It's going out and starting instances on all of those nodes. And then it's connecting those to the reducer. And then the reducer is returning the report that you're seeing here. So we went out and searched 76 different books. So we went out and, store and created 76 different ZeroVM instances. All of those were connected to that single reducer. And this is the output with the top 100 words that, uh, that showed up in Shakespeare's texts. Uh, below that, we've got a detailed execution report for every one of those instances. Uh, it's 
not displayed very pretty here in the, in the UI. That's uh, something we're going to be working on. But basically, for each of those individual instances, you can tell exactly what the wall clock time that that instance was running for, how much actual CPU time that instance took, uh, any I.O. that that instance did. Uh, and this is where we can start to get that granular level of functionality to enable to, you know, us to you know, potentially charge users based on just you know, the few milliseconds um, or seconds of CPU time that, uh, that their particular job took, even though it was run across a large cluster of nodes. All right. So the next demo that I want to show is the ability to actually manipulate images and objects dynamically as they're being retrieved out of Swift. So what we have is we have a images container. We've got a couple images here. One of them is spiral, which is what I'll use for the demo. Um, and so this is the image that is stored inside of Swift right now. So the image doesn't contain any type of watermark or anything. It's just a plain, it's a plain image. Um, and what we've done is we've set, we've set up our account so that every time we open an image that is of, of a certain particular content type, in this case JPEG, we are actually going to execute a zero VM application on that image and we're going to dynamically insert a watermark on that image as it's being retrieved out of Swift. So if we go ahead and open this spiral image, it's actually going and it's watermarking that image on the fly and inserting uh, the zero VM watermark which we set up our application to just use that watermark. Um, and the cool thing is you can actually then pass arguments into that zero VM application uh, to do different things. So if you want to move that watermark around, you can pass arguments and say x equals 100, and let's say y equals 100, and this will, if you open that URL now, those arguments got passed in through the URL to the zero VM application and it dynamically adjusted the position of the watermark in the image. Um, you could imagine using this to store kind of a single version of an image in Swift and then serving different resolutions or different formats of that image uh, based on different you know, target devices or different use cases uh, instead of having to kind of create uh, an entire group of images based on every possible configuration or, or target device that you would like to see. All right. So switching back to the presentation here. <laughs> and it worked. All right, that was good. <laughs> so what are some of the future possibilities with zero VM and Swift? So at the most basic use case, you know, you can imagine having a object storage offering where instead of just having to store uh, static objects and, and you know, retrieving them out of the storage offering if you want to do any processing with them, you can do basic things like you know, search those objects, kind of like we were doing with the, uh, with the word count example, um, or somehow process or manipulate those objects. You can imagine having a container full of images and you want to go through and generate thumbnails on all those images. Well, instead of having to download those all locally, generate the thumbnails, you can just write a little zero VM application that generates thumbnails. You can push it up and it'll execute on the object storage nodes where those objects exist, where those images exist, and you can create the output as a new container that's full of just the thumbnails of all those images. So things like this that are just a better object storage uh, offering. Uh, and eventually, if you start thinking about more and more use cases you can do like that, you start to think about creating this entire compute and storage big data platform. Um, you can start to do full MapReduce operations. We are looking at the possibility of porting, you know, tools from the Hadoop ecosystem, say, to be able to run natively on top of the combination of zero VM plus Swift. Uh, so instead of having to stand up your own dedicated HDFS cluster, you can just borrow a public cloud cluster for a few seconds to run any type of uh, big data analysis jobs that you want. Uh, we're also looking at kind of, you know, the idea of targeting solutions at specific verticals. You know, the media and entertainment space has a lot of use cases around rendering and transcoding media. We could see kind of a portfolio of solutions that could be built around that. Um, the big data space, there's a lot, you know, especially scientific Python um, is something that we think there's a lot of different use cases that could be very applicable for this type of solution. Um, and then the idea that you can start to, using ZeroVM, push dynamic content creation to the edge. So instead of just CDNing, 
static content, actually being able to start pushing that dynamic content out to the edge uh, for applications where that type of performance makes a lot of sense. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left, and what I wanted to do is uh, invite Camwell up on stage with me um, and open it up to the audience if they had any questions about ZeroVM, the technology, the integration with Swift. Uh, up here, you'll see all of the contact information for the project, our website, the GitHub uh, organization, our mailing list, as well as uh, our IRC channel on Freenode. So, uh, and if you do have questions, if you can please use the microphones uh, for the recording, that way those can be um, heard by anybody that happens to be watching this later on. John, <laughs> how's it going? Great, this is a fun demo, uh, right. it's great. Um, I have one question about the way that the compute is done with the replicas of the data. So for example, yep. you've got your full text search or your you know, watermarking, um, and you've got three replicas of the data. So are you doing three times the compute or and just taking the one that fails first? Or I mean, ignoring failures or um, is that like an HA strategy, or are you just doing it on one, or how's that working? Yeah, so, so today we have what I like to describe a very naive job scheduler. So it basically picks randomly one of the copies, one of the replicas, um, and goes and you know, decides to go execute on, against that replica, and it ignores the other two replicas. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, we, could, we could execute on all three in parallel and you know, just grab whichever result finishes first. Um, <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, we could also um, do things like, you know, have if, you know, if you have a zero VM instance that fails. So right now, if you, if you happen to get to, Constantine wants to come up here and, and, and talk about this as well, I think. Um, but, you know, you could have something where if, if one node is much busier than another node for whatever reason, you could pick like the least busiest uh, replica or the node with the replica that's the least busy. We've got some of that in Swift today, so it'd be kind of cool to see those, uh, those kind of contributions for doing that with just the read and write affinity, and then adding that in to say, hey, let's put in something else. That'd be kind of cool. Sounds good. Thanks. And Constantine, uh, do you have something to add? Yeah. Uh, right now, if you write things back to Swift, we, just run, uh, we can run things three times. Okay. It just, just works right now. I think the default action is if you write something back to Swift, it will run three times. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. Great. Look at that. I learned something. All right, another question over here. Uh, I guess since we're on the watermark example, was yep. that were you guys using Pill for the uh, or some Python or imaging library for the the watermark stuff? Yeah, so the library that we were using, um, I'm trying to think, Ron P. Well, if so I'm not so as a lead in, I'm actually curious. Like, what about other uh, Python compiled dependencies like NumPy or NumPy, depending on your pronunciation? Yeah, so, and we so, have compiled Python dependencies for the scripts that we're running in zero VM. Exactly. So, so we have a set of standard libraries already ported running inside the zero VM runtime. We'd like to expand that set. Uh, like NumPy is not one of those right now. So if you'd like to do anything with that, it's going to take a little bit of work to kind of get that ported and, and compiled to run inside of zero VM. Um, as a community, what we'd like to do is start growing that base of kind of cross-compiled libraries and, and application frameworks. Um, to, to make it easier for people that, that have different use cases like that. Uh, one question. Um, how to keep the data safe, safe, safe um, to, keep, uh, um, to prevent the malicious code to do bad things, uh, damage your data? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the whole point about zero VM is a, a very high security. Uh, zero VM is based on uh, Chrome and ACL. It's like describe it, and um, uh, it's impossible to get out of the framework. So all your data uh, that the code has is only the data which uh, operator or account owner allowed you to access. So uh, uh, from inside zero VM, uh, you can see data is uh, open at files, and you can write only to, to open file handlers. Okay, so you you cannot access any system resource, uh, resources. Yeah, and, and, and right now, when you present an object to a zero VM um, instance, it's actually presented as read only. So you're not you're not going to be able to, you know, accidentally or maliciously, uh, you know, stomp on your existing the original object, the original data. So everything output is either written as a temporary file and then returned as part of the request, or it's written as a new object inside of Swift. Another question over here. Uh, very similar question. Does the um, um, does the virtual machine uh, block opcodes that are 
are not allowed inside the specification, or does it rely on the compiler to not include those? Uh, we rely on our own tool chain, our own compiler. So you, you cannot just run any binary. You, you need to use our uh, GCC tool chain, or we also support LLVM tool chain, two tool chains. And only co compiled with those tool chain would actually run. Of course, in, in runtime, we do the validation. OK, so there is validation. So I, if I, could, I can't write a bad binary and yeah. then the and get and get it to fully compile. That's yeah, exactly. I, okay. uh, the validator we use is a verbatim copied from a Chromium project, so um, zero VM as secure as the Chrome sandbox. Yep. Cool. Over here, you showed uh, in your watermark demo um, executing code on retrieval. Can you also execute code on ingest? So we've talked about a couple ways to kind of put hooks into uh, the system to do that. Right now, it's, it's not fully there. We've got some ideas about how to implement that. Um, that's something that we actually wanted to talk with some of the guys in the, in the Swift community about, because I think there's already some, some work being done around there. So we uh, want to make sure we tie in with that. Uh, also, how flexible is choosing what data to, to, to execute on? Is it just by file type, or? Yeah, uh, it's uh, fully flexible. Right now, you can access container database also as a read-only file. So you can, for example, select from container database in any type of select you like. For example, you want to select something by name or by regex, anything you uh, uh, SQLite supports, you can do that and then uh, act on the result of that, like choose objects. OK, another question over here. Yeah, if you still have time. Uh, yep. I, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the data pipeline on the MapReduce job that you had mm -hmm. done. Uh, how is the mapper processes communicating their results to the reducers? Does that get stored in Swift as a temporary file, or is it using zero VM, uh, the ZeroMQ channel? By the way, this, this is Constantine here. He's one of the uh, co-creators of ZeroVM, and he is also the uh, guru with the Zero Cloud middleware. So that's why he's answering a lot of these questions about the details uh, in the workings there. Uh, uh, we, do, we can do it uh, both ways. Uh, in the demo, it just uh, relied on ZeroMQ and transferred it over the network to the reducer nodes. How much data was being processed in the Gutenberg uh, example? I think it was uh, very little data, like 270 megabytes, something yeah, like a, that. It was a few hundred megs. Yeah. So the the most uh, like the most time it takes is just to set up the cluster because if you set up the cluster of 76 machines or we had the de demo where we set up cluster of 750 machines, it uh, takes a couple of seconds, like 10 seconds, just to set up the thing. Yeah. So so the way the way that the cluster is set up, the, the way that networking works inside the Zebra cluster today, if you create um, a cluster of 750 zero VM instances, for example. You know, the networking would be set up for each of those, and they would each be connected however it was described in the job description file. We've got some enhancements to the networking stack, which we are getting ready to push out probably next week. Um, and that basically relies on a networking broker that, that sits on each physical node um, and maintains those network connections between the different physical nodes within the cluster. Um, so it's going to significantly reduce the startup time um, and, and you know, we did some testing in our staging environment that you know cut some of that time, the execution time in half, simply by reducing the uh, startup time. Uh, Greg, I'm curious about what the uh, biggest challenges are on the cross compiling, on the porting, say of NumPy and other things. What do you think the biggest, the hardest parts are? Uh, well. Uh there are two uh, challenges. The first challenge uh, uh, with uh, NumPy and more SciPy is that uh, it's a library that is more scale up. Yeah, and uh, on our computing environment, uh, we better use it for a scale out systems. That's one. Uh, the, the second one is uh, that um, SciPy uses uh, in few places uh, Fortran and some exotic stuff which are not yet supported. So. Uh, the most of uh, parts of NumPy is already uh, recompiled just for, from the first try and, and working. Oh, so would when you, when you uh, bring in a new library and you just, I assume you just try to cross compile and see what doesn't work? It, exactly. What, what is that first few levels of stuff that needs to be ported? 
Like what are the calls? What, what isn't supported? <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the main obstacle right now for NumPy is libffi because it's written uh, completely in assembly and not compatible assembly to the knuckle. Gotcha, gotcha. So you need to rewrite it with knuckle assembly. And it can be done only manually. You cannot like do anything about that. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, after libffi, I think it will be just a breeze because everything else is OK. Uh, so uh, usually uh, the stuff which is written in uh, pure Python, pure uh, C, is uh, usually work uh, out of the box immediately. All right, I think we got time for one more question. Okay, <laughs> one more question. Yep. Uh, from the uh, performance p perspective, um, do you have some uh, uh, how to handle the performance overhead? Um, because the um, storage node is uh, I/O intensive. Uh, but you introduce the computing into the uh, storage node. How do you keep the uh, to uh, keep the uh, computing power uh, for for the uh, I/O? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, first of all, in in regular Swift, if you don't uh, run there any computing, the, the alternative would be to get all the data out. And by getting all the data out is. Uh, also not a very lightweight uh, operation just to get data out of the Swift. So um, a, a, if you do s uh, some data intensive lightweight processing, then it makes sense to push it uh, into the Swift. Yeah, of course, if your processing is very heavyweight, like hours over hours of processing the same data, probably it's not the best case to do it inside the Swift. OK, okay so uh, that type of computing is uh, is basically for a, a, a lightweight data intensive processing, and in that case, the actual load on Swift server would be less than I the alternative, uh, just taking all the data out, processing it, and then putting it back. All right. So, so I wanted to thank everybody. We are going to be around all afternoon at our booth, which is kind of right outside across the aisle there. Tomorrow morning, we also have a three-hour session where we're going to kind of doing a deep dive into some of the technical areas of, uh, of this integration. So if you're interested in learning more, visit us tomorrow morning. We're going to be up in room 405. Uh, and thank you. <laughs>